We're going to start that again because that was also sh Why can't I say, what is wrong with me? Right, we're going to try again. So hello everyone, welcome to this week's YouTube tutorial. My name is Mike Ingledew and I'm all about making you successful with your integrated product support strategies, whether that's identifying software specifications or standards or identifying the necessary skills that you need within your organization. All the S's. So um, this week I'm going to talk a little bit about what is known as tag abuse and uh, I'm going to come on to that very shortly but what I want to do first is a couple of public service announcements. Firstly, thank you to everybody who is sending in your comments and your suggestions and your questions, which is driving a lot of what's happening here at TDW. Deeply, deeply appreciated and thank you. But I want to talk about a couple of things that you can gain access to here at TDW. This week we have released our first uh, issue or formal issue of the TDW magazine for 2021 and uh, it's available completely free of charge on our website. Just head on over to the link below. Uh, all you have to do is register for it. Massive thank you and shout out to everybody who contributed this quarter. And um, just go over to our website, you can download it, you can read it, you can distribute it inside your organization and uh, fully interactive. And uh, we have a bit of fun putting that together. So please do go over and have a look at that. Uh, secondly, if you haven't seen that uh, we have announced recently that we were doing our first ever spring innovation in integrated product support. Uh, we have released all of those videos, again, completely free of charge on our website. You can head on over and watch those completely free. Just register and you can see from some of the software vendors that are supporting us at TDW what they are doing with things like augmented reality, how they are using things like 3D and creating illustrations and all of that wonderful goodness. So there's some great presentations over there. Thank you to everybody who supported that. Again, free. Go check out the link below. You can go and watch that. But today, let's talk a little bit about tag abuse. Now, tag abuse is something that happens and I've seen it happen. In fact, recently somebody sent me a whole bunch of data modules and I could see that there was lots of tag abuse happening in there. This is not my term. I didn't make this up. This belongs to somebody else. I've just asked if I can use it to do a YouTube tutorial because I thought it was fantastic and I'd never heard it used before. So thank you for allowing me to, to do that. But today we are going to be talking very, very specifically about tag abuse and what does that mean? And I'm going to give you a real example of where it could have uh, where it could have come in and uh, it could have caused us a little bit of uh, well, it did cause a little bit of interesting debate. But this is why we talk about removing the author from worrying about the formatted output. They worry about the valid structure of our technical content. So we are worrying more about the actual, you know, ensuring that the building blocks of our data modules or our documents are correct. Um, but that doesn't mean to say as technical authors or information producers that we don't have to be aware of what a paragraph is, what a list is, the types of lists, what do we mean by warnings and cautions. And in the back of our mind, we we have an idea of how it's being presented and what it, what it should be presented like. But we that shouldn't be our overriding concern. We should be concerned about the quality of the content and we should be uh, concerned about the quality of the structure of that content. So we are going to talk about something today as I switch back to my slides, something called tag abuse. And again, thank you for allowing me to use this. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to introduce to you a, a, a real life example. I've done lots of uh, changing names, etc., just to protect the innocent. Uh, but we're going to talk a bit about um, why we must follow the forget style and formatting rules. This is something that I spend a lot of my time training authors on. And, you know, I've got lots of stories, too much for uh, today, where I'm training traditional technical authors, of which I'm one, by the way, of how to um, move away from worrying about the prettiness and the, and the look and feel of a document and focusing on that structure. So we are going to be looking at... Um, this particular rule itself. Why, as authors, we need to forget style and, and formatting rules. It doesn't mean we don't have to be cognizant of them. Uh, it means that we need to be aware of them, but not uh, driven by them. 
And so the situation we were in, and I've uh, again, I've simplified this and I have removed any uh, sort of identifications of organizations or projects or whatever that, I, that we may be working on here. So we're converting a very large uh, PDF file and we are converting it to S1000D XML data modules and gone through the whole process of uh, how we would do that. Nothing untoward here so far, I hear you say, and uh, because that's kind of traditional. Lots of us are doing that. Lots of us are taking PDF documents or paper-based documents, converting them to S1000D, and doing that via our S1000D XML data modules. So I, I'm going to talk about a specific problem that we encountered. So we have gone through the uh, a lot of the conversion process and we have published this document and there are and now we're in the, the stages of uh, validating and verifying the look and feel. And the idea is, is that we want to try and match as much as we can to the original look and feel of the document because we don't want to confuse users or, um, you know, is somehow disable their ability to use the document. So as best as we can, we are trying to maintain the look and feel of the original document. And I can hear lots of you screaming at your uh, at your your laptops and, and your devices right now saying, well, why are you bothered about it? Because there's a very specific reason why we need to do that. But I have oversimplified this example. We have a piece of content which is structurally valid and has a load of XML going on behind it and it was being presented in one long linear line. And what we actually needed is we needed it to be presented split over a couple of lines. And the only way for us to uh, force that split is of course either go and uh, change the XML structures so that the style sheets can pick up on the, the XML structure changes so it knows what to do with it. Or, as Ingledew just said, just throw in an empty paragraph, that'll fix it. And yes, I know you're all screaming at your YouTube screens right now, throwing your coffee cups against the wall and uh, getting rather upset. And yes, I know. And we had a bit of a, it was almost like everybody fainted on the call when I said it. It's quick, it's easy, it does the job, it's dirty, it's not right, but it works. And so the reality is, is there's consequences to doing that. And I'm going to come on at the end of this, I'm going to say why are authors doing that today and give you some real examples of why that's happening. But yes, it would have fixed our problem. But the the immediate answer I got from one of the young ladies on the call was, well, that would be tag abuse. And we had a little bit of a laugh about it. And uh, I asked if there was a helpline and that kind of stuff. But actually, this is true. It is tag abuse. Again, I've never heard this term before uh, and I quite like it. So I actually think it'd be great on a T-shirt. Not that many of us in the world would get it. But um, so, you know, I'm thinking tag abuse. Yes, what a great idea for a YouTube tutorial. Why is it we have to remove the author from worrying about formatted output and get them to focus on purely uh, valid structured XML? So what is it that's actually controlling the look and feel of that particular piece of information? Well, we have style sheet languages and depending on your software tool, depends on what which style sheet languages they are using. And uh, But in the main, they all do exactly the same kind of principally the same thing. They all follow uh, or are used to control what it is we want this piece of text to look like. And the style sheet will decide based on where it is and where it is positioned within a piece of structured information, how and what we are going to do to this piece of content. So how are we going to format it? How are we going, which fonts are we going to use? Are we going to have any borders, uh, different colors, backgrounds, uh, all of these kind of things. This is why I say, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this over the coming weeks when we talk about the process data module. And we talk about more about IETPs. You're asking more about IETPs is that it will help you massively if you have somebody on your team who actually understands things like style sheeting languages or understands, uh, you know, transformation languages, uh, because tech docs now are becoming much more of um, a technological kind of challenge as well as, you know, the content itself. So it will help you to have these kind of people with these skills on your team, or at least work with an organization that can help you do that. 
So if I um, forced through my empty paragraph, the empty paragraph itself would have given us the desired outputs. Now, please, those of you uh, who are still screaming and haven't calmed down yet, the the um, this has been oversimplified for uh, for YouTube just for speed. And, uh, you know, there was lots going on inside this XML statement and which is when I then said, we'll just put in an empty paragraph and it would force the change. Uh, but that was there was going to be consequences to that. The empty paragraph in this instance would have given us uh, the desired output for our format and um, it would have parsed as well. But it's bad writing practice. We shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, I know that there are organizations out there that are doing it. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, somebody sent me some data modules really recently where there was lots of this going on. And so whilst it would have given us that formatted output, uh, it is very, very bad structured writing practice for us to do that. And I'm not talking here about an author going through and throwing in a paragraph because he knows it or she knows that they're coming back to that to fill out the content. I'm talking about here inserting an empty element that is actually being used specifically to control how we want a piece of information to be, in this case, broken over two lines. So again, it's been massively simplified. So she's right, of course, because we have this style sheeting language that is controlling how we publish our uh, data modules out to a PDF. And that PDF is being controlled and presented. All the look and feel, the pagination, everything is all coming from the controls within the, that style sheet and within the software. So, and that is where we should be focusing our energy on making sure that it is controlling everything from that particular area and not in the, uh, the empty paragraph uh, insertion, which is what I talked about. But the, the reality here is that the if we have a situation where, for example, we have a new set of style sheets or we have uh, a new piece of publishing software or we have something along those lines that will um, interpret or have to interpret the content in the same way as the, the publishing system or solution that we have already today. Uh, there are consequences here. So if we still have our content split over by an empty paragraph, that empty paragraph would be taken by the new publishing solution and we still need to get out to our PDF and we still may also need to get out to an interactive manual. The problem with this is that if those style sheets are interpreting that XML structure in a different way, and or they have the correct and expected rules for presenting that particular particular piece of XML structure, we are now going to introduce lots of areas of possibly white space within our technical document, or if we're going out to screen, there'll be lots of blank areas and the areas would actually be very, very difficult for us to actually um, navigate around. The user would have less confidence in the content that we've given them. So what we could be doing is actually uh, going out to another publishing system. So maybe all of the content, it's not on this particular project, but maybe on a project we have all of the uh, modules are being shared amongst you know lots of different partners and we're all going to share the content and we're all going to use our own different publishing engines to go out to wherever we want to go out to. Uh, if we've got our content that's littered with empty tags, uh, these will be interpreted uh, differently by different publishing engines, which means that there will likely be uh, different look and feels out there or different pagination for our common content. And this is the problem that uh, inserting or tag abusing our content could actually introduce. So if we en entered that empty paragraph, and we're going to come back to this empty paragraph again now, is that again, the empty paragraph um, would give us that desired formatted output for this particular set of style sheets and for this particular uh, publishing 
tool. Um, and it would parse, as I've said, but we could also run the risk if we are um, supplying this content up to a prime or to a customer. That might be one of our checks. That might be one of our validation checks to ensure that there are no uh, empty paragraphs, empty bulleted lists or list items or anything along those lines that may reject our content. And that would then ping it back down to us as a uh, rejected piece of deliverable. So the reality is that new software and style sheets could and probably would interpret those uh, structures uh, very, very differently and leading to the um, leading to the different styles, different look and feel, empty spaces, uh, effects on pagination, all those kind of things that uh, we may not necessarily care about um, immediately because, you know, we're just trying to get the document out of the uh, out of the, the door. So this tag abuse is absolutely whilst we laughed about it and we had a little bit of a chuckle about it. It's actually has a lot of consequences if we don't actually uh, follow these rules of the technical author should focus on structure and valid structure and ensuring that we're doing all of the things right in accordance with good writing practice and allow the software to do what the software needs to do, which is take all of those valid structures, apply all of the styles and publish it to your desired publishing output. The answer, of course, is to make sure the style sheets are doing what you need it to do, or you have a writing rule that tells you how for that specific instance that you want that piece of XML to be created and therefore your style sheet can actually interpret it and publish it how you need it to be done. So finally, for this little piece, I just want to talk about a little bit more about my thoughts on this. And, you know, my thoughts here are is that the reality is, is that tag abuse happens. OK, and it happens and it happens for a multitude of reasons. And this is because I've seen it and I continue continue to see it in uh, customers data. And, you know, it's because the author is still very much thinking in two different areas. And it's because the authors are not aware of the uh, consequences of uh, actually getting the, the structure wrong. And, uh, you know, it might seem kind of, you know, benign to put some kind of empty paragraph in. Uh, but it does, uh, it comes down to a little bit of uh, lack of knowledge of how it affects everything down the chain. Uh, of course, we're all under time pressures. So I have seen projects go, just do that quickly, throw in an empty paragraph, we'll publish it, and it will give us the desired output. That then gets forgotten. And uh, then the uh, the consequences or the quincy quances are uh, felt felt later on down the line, and um, it's expensive style sheet changes is one of the big uh, issues that that I see, and this is well, it's it's relative, you know, how expensive does it get when we have to go back and fix a load of our data because it's carrying a bunch of empty elements that we need to, uh, that could easily have been taken care of in one set of style sheets that uh, could look after the whole data sets. And then, you know, if we're throwing in lots of empty elements and those kind of things, and then that, that I leave the organization, uh, who's to say that nobody ever picks that up and it actually causes us problems down the line uh, when it comes to publishing. So, you know, and finally, it comes down to bad habits actually do die hard. You know, I, I personally still find myself occasionally slipping back into my old traditional technical authoring ways or, you know, I'm still focusing too much on I really want this document to look nice, look pretty. Uh, and how am I going to do that? Well, I should be doing that through style sheets, not through uh, Ingledew dicking around with uh, with structure. So all of this does come down to tag abuse. And, you know, uh, I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody. You know, I know projects that are doing this and I know that uh, it happens. And pretty much for those reasons that I just talked about on that final slide is that, you know, speed, uh, lack of knowledge, 
and we haven't got the money to pay somebody to come and change style sheets for us. And, uh, you know, so we, we try and work around it and we try and figure it out for ourselves. And, you know, the question is, is, you know, where do you want to save the money? Is it now by getting the style sheets done or is it, you know, just, you know, you're going to be doing lots of fault finding later on down the line. So that's it for this week. That's all about tag abuse. You know who you are. Thank you for giving me permission to use this. And, uh, you know, I, I did quite like this one and uh, I quite enjoyed putting this one together because it's a real problem. And, you know, and the fact that you've termed it and you've named it shows that also it's a problem for you and your customers too. So um, until next week, Make sure you uh, sign up to the, the magazine and the Sprips event. Completely free on, online. Go do that. Next week, I am definitely doing a piece on software. I am hoping that that uh, will get validated and thrown through uh, the QA process by next week. Until then, stay safe. If you're celebrating or you have celebrated, happy Easter wherever you are in the world. And um, stay safe, everyone. See you on the other side.